Welcome back folks. What I'm going to do today, just going to do a quick video. I'm going to tear this down a little bit because what I think has happened to this meter and uh, I don't want to demonstrate it because it just damages uh, the, the movement every time you use it. But uh, when I received this back a few uh, months ago from my brother-in-law, uh, it only came up so far and would stop, a hard stop. And I've seen that happen with Simpsons 270 and 260 before, especially the 260. Um, this is the only 270 I've ever had the pleasure of actually using. But you see it's got a couple of hits here on the side. I don't know if you can see that. And what happens uh, is, is that the, there's four little stanchions in here that have machine screws going into them. And if it gets a good enough hit, one of those will break off and then you'll get a piece of Bakelite floating around in there. And I think that's what's caused the problem. And also if you listen to this, I mean, there's something moving around in there, so uh, and it needs to have that looked at too before we get too fancy with using it. And it needs to be cleaned up a good deal as well. So let's uh, let's get right into it. And uh, as we do it, I'll talk uh, about a little bit about uh, analog meters and why why you need them. I mean, one of the one of the main reasons that they're available today uh, is for environments where there can be zero emissions, and probably that's the most important application. These don't emit anything. They don't have microprocessors in them. They're not doing analog to digital conversion and using high frequencies of any kind or emitting any kind of radiation. They're just analog meters. They're, they're passive devices. And so they, they're zero emission. So if when you have to work in a, an environment that needs to be zero emission, like in a, a physics laboratory of some kind or in, you know, dealing with some sort of sensitive medical equipment or something of that nature, you can't use anything but an analog meter and generally speaking they're not going to take you too seriously if you walk in with a, a $10 AliExpress cheapie. So that's why Simpson are still making meters and that's why they're still charging uh, up to $1,000 for one of these uh, because uh, they're important. Now another another um, great reason for them is they're, is they're, is they're pretty responsive. Um, they, they get to where they're going a lot quicker than a, a digital multimeter will. So uh, and that's especially important if the if the signal is changing. Like so if you've got a voltage that's going up and down or a current that's going up and down like this, that'll drive a digital multimeter crazy, especially if it has to switch ranges to, to display that. You'll never see anything. You'll never see anything on the meter whatsoever. And this you will. And what we used to do with the we had a bunch of these at a, a place I used to work at XL Communications. We had a factory here in Canada and um, in in the factory, they would bring in resistors and other components, and they they test them. Uh, so they bring in a you know a few tens of thousands of resistors, and they may test one out of every hundred to see if they fit. They're all five percent resistors, so it's no big deal. So what we would do, we would create little jigs for our. There were Simpson two sixties in that particular case. We'd create little jigs for them that they could plug in the Simpson. The Simpson was set up on a, on like the ten volt range. It was never. The operator didn't have to do anything with it. The meter was set at an angle to them, and we draw a couple of little lines on it. So if they're testing 5K resistors, they take out the 5K jig, and they put the resistors in, and the needle will come up. As long as it went between those two lines, it was a go. Imagine trying to do that with a digital meter, trying to figure out, oh, is 993 ohms within... No, you can't do it with a digital meter, right? You can't do it rapidly anyway, not as quickly as these guys wanted to do it. So we would set up these little jigs, we were just making these microprocessor controlled little teleprinters so there wasn't a whole bunch of different resistor values in it. So it was easy enough to do to set up, you know, five or six jigs for people to test the five or six different values of resistors as they came in. And they could do it very rapidly, bang, 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 bang. So that was another, that's another really good application. So, I mean, you could think of other applications, uh, you know, especially like if you've got a noisy signal, so a, a signal that's got quite a bit of, uh, you know, medium frequency noise and it is bouncing around all over the place. Because these meters are, they're, they're responsive, but they're not that responsive. Like they're, they're not, they're not the, the needle's not going to vibrate very much at 60 hertz. But a digital meter will try and it's going to just give you a whole bunch of nonsense. You're not going to be able to get a, a, an average reading. These will give you, automatically give you an average reading, right? You may see a little kind of flutter in the needle, but you'll know roughly where you need to be. Using a meter like this, it's, it's dead easy. You can get a good idea of what the average is. Anyway, enough of that nonsense. Uh, let, me, let me take this apart and find out what's rattling around in it and see if we can 
See if we can get this, uh, this old piece working again. I don't know if I'm gonna bother actually going through the calibration on this. I don't think it's ever going to be pushed into active use. Well, here's the battery compartment and it gives you access to the fuses too. So here are the fuses here. You got the, the, the big fuse on this side. Yeah. And you have the little fuse on this side. Now, if I recall correctly, this thing wasn't used much for current measurements. So I think those fuses are probably okay, but I'll test them. If I ever go to use this meter, I'll test all that stuff out. You put a D-size cell in there and a nine volt cell in here. The, the D-size cell and the nine volt cell are used for the ohms ranges. The nine volts is used for the higher ohms. The D is used for lower ohms ranges. And uh, then we have these four screws to take the main case off. All the screws in this, by the way, are, are they're stainless steel. They don't come out with a magnet and uh, they're all flathead. This was uh, this particular unit was built in Canada, but I believe the ones built in the States were uh, built exactly the same way. And like I say, this meter, I think, uh, goes back to the 80s sometime when it was first introduced in the late 70s as an upgrade to the 260. But it never really quite took over for the 260. Like the 260 is still, I think, the more popular meter. There we go. That hasn't been opened in some long time. It may never have been opened. Okay, something just fell out past my finger. Okay, here's a screw. Yeah, this is one of the little screws that holds the bezel in place. Uh, I still think I hear something rattling in there. Let, let's take the meter bezel off and see what we find in there. Well, I think the difference between main, the main difference between this and the 260, of course, it's got a slightly different circuit arrangement, but this is all on a single PCB board, or at least was at this time. As you can see, it's a single PCB board. All the resistors in here, as far as I can see, are all this one here is a, is a 5%, it's got a gold band on it, but all the rest of them are 0.5%. This is a 5%, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0.5. And uh, look at the, like, I mean, they're not very sophisticated switches, but I'll tell you, they've, they've lasted. Like I said, I think I got introduced to this meter in the 90s. So I know it's been around for at least 30 years doing its job. Okay. All right, so all our screws are out. Ah, uh, there we go, there we go, there we go. So there's the piece of Bakelite and it broke off this here. I wonder if this could be glued back in place. Maybe use some some crazy glue just to hold that in place. The only problem with that is, you know, I've tried fixing meters like this in the past and, uh, and they never seem to be quite as good a repair as the original. And what en ends up happening is the slightest hit or something like that and this is, is going to break off again and cause you the same problems. I'm tempted to just leave this out for now. I'll put it in a little bag and maybe uh, yeah, if I come up with a better idea in the future. If you guys have any idea of how I could glue that on there so it's not going to move, let me know down in the comments. I'd appreciate that. But um, you now, the meter movement. Well, one thing I should mention about these meter movements is, these are what's called a taut band meter movement. And I'm just wondering if I could demonstrate that. So what it is, is basically it, it, it doesn't have any bearings. And that's uh, one of the unique things about this uh, meter. And one of the things that makes it expensive is that the, the, the whole movement here, the coil, the needle and everything is suspended on a really tight metal band for, from the bottom and the top. And that band, as it twists, uh, it, you know, it, it's got a built in spring and it, it, it could bring the, uh, needle back to where it, it zeroed. The advantage to that, of course, is that there's no stiction. There's no, there's no force required for it to overcome the initial stiction on the bearing. So it, they're very, 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 very sensitive to very small inputs. And it's one thing that makes it uh, um, a little bit more expensive than let's say that, that my quantum meter that I showed you before, this one here. So this one here does not use a taut band. It uses a jeweled movement, so it's got two little rubies or something like that that the 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 bearing of the movement is is placed in between. 
So, but they have their issues, but they do last a long time. They're, they're pretty sturdy. These ones are a little bit less sturdy. And this is also a shielded uh, movement. So it, if you have very large fields, like magnetic fields in the area, or electric fields, it gets shielded against it to prevent uh, erroneous readings caused by that. But uh, okay, so that's it. Let, let's put it back together again and just run a, a couple of voltages through it and see what it comes up with. Another thing I have to do is, is I have to clean up the terminals. It looks like this was used almost exclusively as a voltmeter during its time. It may have been used to, to measure some current, but uh, if I call, recall correctly, that was never really done um, at, at that plant. We used to use clamp meters for current because we, we weren't generally dealing with small amounts of current. We were dealing with, uh, you know, 50 horsepower motors driving huge, big, uh, huge, big plastic extrusion pumps, stuff like that assembly line stuff one thing about these meters if you ever do take one apart and you're going to do something like this you now tighten up these screws very gingerly it's slightest little over tightening tightening and that uh, that little stanchion that you know like this one here that broke they just crack so be very 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 gentle to tightening these up now i'm not going to put that other screw back in because it's just going to fall out again i'm sure yeah so you got you know we've got three screws holding this in and those three screws all three of them probably hold up a small car so you don't have that kind of force required here i don't know see these got a kind of a strange uh plug on them they're kind of like a banana plug but back backwards the male is in here and this is a female so I don't know if um, Simpson are still using that kind of connector arrangement anymore. So I don't know if these leads are replaceable in that respect. I think some other companies make replacement leads for them too. Maybe Probe Master do. Okay, so let's see now if we can get full deflection on the meter. And So let's go to DC volts, 10 volts. And I'm gonna bring up a power supply here. And we've got this thing here set for five volts. So we'll turn that on. And see, okay. So it's, it wasn't getting past around about three and a half volts before. So let me, let me up that to a full 10 volts. I see that, I mean, look, look how quickly that reads. So in about half a second, you're, at your voltage and uh, you know even a very fast DMM I think the very few of them would be able to measure that kind that quickly uh, and settle down especially if it has to go to three or four ranges or something like that before it gets there okay this, this looks like it's working okay and uh, you know uh, if my power supply if my segment uh, power supply here is accurate then it's uh, it's pretty darn accurate it could use a tiny little bit of adjustment like I say, I don't know if I'm going to bother with that. Anyway, that's it. I got done what I needed to get done today. And I'm going to leave these parts out. I'll put them in a little bag and keep them with the meter. Tape them to the back and put them in the battery compartment. And just in case I come up with a brilliant idea on how to fix this so that it doesn't, you know, fly apart again. Now, another thing I have to do, it looks like, uh, it looks like for some reason that this input was used. Maybe uh, maybe for some sort of sensor or something like that. But that's the 50 microamp, 250 millivolt input. There's not much in an industrial setting that's in that range. And uh, But all these ones here, like if you look at these all here, I, if you see into them, I don't know if you can or not, but they have uh, this black coating throughout them. So one of the, there was two parts to that factory. One part was using PVC, which is a pretty clean material. The other part was using ABS to produce uh, drain waste vent pipes. And that environment was filthy. It, it, that dust from that environment spread throughout the entire place. And it looks like it's got all this ABS dust compacted onto the, those terminals in there. If anybody's got any idea how I might be able to get that off, I'd appreciate it if you leave me a little note in the comments below. That would be nice. 
so that if I if ever do get around to you know rejuvenating this completely I can uh, I can do that and get those cleaned up because that would be nice to do anyway if you have any ideas a on how to clean these dirty terminals and B on how to fix the the stanchion I think it's over on this side here how to fix this uh, so that it won't uh, flake off at any minute and cause problems again please let me know and uh, thank you very much for joining me today also let me know if you if you want me to do a calibration of this and, and get it up and running fully put some batteries in it and run through all its features talk band suspension there it's written right there special feature yeah just let me know and uh thank you very much for joining me today and we'll see you in the next video which should be coming up on tuesday or something like that all right bye bye